Before we get into your challenger, talk about you, kind of introduce yourself, kind of give us a little bit of your history on bikes, how you got started, that kind of deal. Well, I'm Kyle Birch. I own Forever Rad. And uh, basically what we do here is just build really, really cool motorcycles that look great, perform great, um, get ridden, um, just try to do everything to the best of our ability. So um, I would say that I started with motorcycles probably uh, I'd say about 13 years ago. Um, at the time, my girlfriend was pregnant with our son, and I decided it'd be a good idea to buy a motorcycle. Perfect timing. Yeah, <laughs> and um, I don't know, like I, you know, like my dad always rode motorcycles when I was a kid, but I didn't really ride with him or anything. I didn't understand it. Um, he did the biker thing with the long hair and the the beers and the choppers mm -hmm. and all that. Um, but I was just like a skater kid, and it, that didn't really appeal to me. But as I got older, you kind of like start to see yourself become your father a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I guess it was just in in me, you know. I was I was I was a car guy, gearhead. I was I have a, a pretty rich history in the the car side. Okay. Um, and so uh, I decided to give bikes a try. It seemed interesting, and. It just so happened that she was pregnant with our first son, and um, she's pretty chill. But that time, she told me, you absolutely are a moron. You can't have a motorcycle. We're about to have a child, right? Like, you're going to kill yourself. Yeah. And so I didn't listen, of course. I kept riding, and it was just a crappy little Yamaha. Mm -hmm. But I made it as cool as I could with limited knowledge. And I really just I loved riding that motorcycle, even though it was a crappy little bike. It was just being on two wheels. Um, I did sell it, and she was very happy. Um, but I would say it couldn't have been more than I don't know, six months later. Our son was born, and I bought another motorcycle, <laughs> basically. Right, yeah. um, and so he's going to be 13 this uh, or coming soon. He's 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 getting up there in age now, and so when I look back, I just think. Well, I guess I've been riding as long as he's been around. Um, so, yeah, it, it feels weird to say it out loud, though, because it doesn't, to me, it doesn't, doesn't really, feel that long. No, not really. I'm just having so much fun with motorcycles that the time is, is clearly just flying. Yeah, flying by. Yeah. Um, in terms of, like, the builder side of things, it kind of, like, did you immediately start, like, the first Yamaha kind of start working on that and building stuff with that? Or kind of when did that stuff really kick off as, like, being a builder? Like building motorcycles yeah. in general, you know, to make a long story short, um, again, I started with cars and, and mini trucks and, and that kind of stuff. So um, fabrication and welding and bodywork and paint and that kind of stuff, I had already been doing that for a long time. Okay. And so uh, probably about close to 10 years, I would say. Okay. Um, none of it was amazing. Some of it was towards the end of that mm -hmm. 10 years, but... Um, Basically, what happened was I grew up in North Dakota, and I, I I didn't like to hunt. I didn't like to fish. I was a gearhead kind of guy, and I was a skateboard kid. And all of that doesn't really work up there. It's, it's too cold. So you find yourself indoors mm -hmm. all winter, which is like six months up there. So um, I just kind of glued myself to the shop and just forced myself to learn things that I nobody ever taught me. Okay. And it just it, you know it turned into a passion. And with that, um, I started getting better at it. So I stuck with it, and I kind of shined above in the bodywork and like fabrication side. Mm -hmm. I was really good with like detailed stuff. Um, so fast forwards, I moved to Illinois um, 13 years ago, and when I moved there, I, I got a job in a in a paint shop. And mm -hmm. It was a custom paint shop where. Um, the owner primarily did 
I would say motorcycles for the most part, but okay. he is, he's done a lot of hot rod stuff and, and you know, um, custom trucks and all that stuff. So when I first got in, I was like, oh, we can start doing a bunch of cool cars and trucks. I didn't care about motorcycles at all. And we did that for the first couple of years. It was fantastic. But during all of those big car builds, truck builds, there was always motorcycle paint jobs. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of just became accustomed to the motorcycle culture throughout that. And eventually it was, it was one of those moments of like, well, you know, the customer wants his bike painted, a bike this size. And while it's sitting there, he says, hey, can you throw some ape hangers on it for me? Or can you switch out the front wheel or whatever? And, and I, I've never done anything like that, but I know how to build cars, <laughs> so mm -hmm. it can't be that tough. Yeah. Um, so I just gave it a shot. And yeah, it was, it was fairly simple for someone who has just some wrenching ability. Mm -hmm. And I have just been hooked ever since. Okay. Um, there's something about being on two wheels mm -hmm. that's so much more enjoyable than driving in a car, yeah. as you would know. Yeah. You know. 100%. Yeah, I would say it's worked out pretty well. Um, you've got this awesome shop now. I know you're putting out some of like the best quality like performance bikes out there. Obviously, your Mustard, the Mustard King you built, you have for a couple of years, just won it born free re recently. Mm -hmm. um, Big Trouble, Mark Norton's CBO Road Glide build that was insane that we covered at Daytona last year. Yeah. Um, so kind of like walk us through your shop here um, and everything you do here and all, all the different types of bikes you work on, that kind of deal. Basically... You know, we, when we had moved to Illinois, um, I built a shop there. It was within my means, you know, size-wise, budget-wise, and um, just worked hard. You know, like, I'm the kind of dude that'll work seven days a week, 14-hour um, days. It just never stops, and um, eventually enough hard work pays off. Mm -hmm. right? You start getting noticed, and, and your quality is always being stepped up, and the customer base is... You know, just it provides you a lot more uh, options and, yeah. and unique um, opportunities. And so eventually I got to the point where we had outgrown the house. We had outgrown the shop. It was time to really step it up. So we started looking and I stumbled across the shop. Um, this place is basically it's the, the building we're in is like 3,500 square feet down here. And then it has a full second level in it mm -hmm. and it's completely empty. It's finished up there but it leads to the possibilities of yeah. anything, right? So being more like, a, like an entrepreneur type mindset, I was like, well, I need this down here, but we can kind of do anything we want up there. I don't know what it, that's gonna be, but we're gonna do something someday, right? So we kind of, we spent a lot of money on this place, but um, you, gotta, you gotta spend it to make it. Yeah. And um, hell man, we've been here for a year and a half, going on two years and we're just killing it. We're blowing up. Um, I can't keep up with the workload. And like I said, the quality continues to be stepped up and we're just having a great time doing it. Yeah. So this shop is the, the step that I needed to take um, to take it further, you know, to show that I'm that serious about mm -hmm. my passion. Mm -hmm. um, and I had a boss um, for 12 years over in Illinois. Mm -hmm. So when I come over here, it was like, make it or make it or break it yeah and it's like the scariest thing you could ever do you yeah. know like you don't know what's going to happen um you just got to believe in yourself you got to work hard and stay focused and um hopefully everything hopefully works, everything out, works out, out for for someone when when you kind of go that route yeah so and i would say it's going really well you know yeah. we're just hard work always pays off yeah so I'm doing something similar recently it's definitely uh it's definitely a pretty daunting um task at least at least in your mind anyway, but no, you know, space is awesome. And obviously you've got some pretty legit bills you've got going on here. And yeah. Stuff. You're yeah pretty... we, got a, we got a lot going on for sure. You mentioned like some of the bikes that were, that we have built. Um, I have a couple of them sitting back here right now. You know, there's just minor upgrades. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this thing got chips or we got to repaint this and I want to switch this part up on this one. And, and so we're con constantly fine tuning everything that we do. Um, but it is important to note that every bike that I build absolutely is being ridden and enjoyed. It's, it's not something that just sits there and looks pretty. Mm -hmm. um, they do sit there and look pretty while they're sitting, but these things are so much more fun to ride. Yeah. Um, and so I'm really trying to push that in the sense of what it is that I ride mm -hmm. and, and kind of that, 
mentality of, hey, you put all this time and money into something, let's actually put it to use, right? Yeah. And so as you do that, shit happens. Mm -hmm. And um, you have to keep up with that maintenance yeah. and chips in the paint yeah. and... You know, things happen, so you yeah. gotta you gotta stay on top of that. <laughs> you build them to ride them, and if you ride them, you gotta take care of them and yeah. do all that work that needs to be done to like keep them at that level. Hey guys, want to take a second and talk about Speed Dealer Performance? You guys will remember Frank from an interview we did a few months back on his incredible FXR. Today specifically, I want to talk about their line of swing arms for FXR, Bagger, and Dyna. These things are incredibly well engineered and put together. Recently, just had one installed in my Bagger. Huge improvement, not only in looks but also in performance with added rigidity at the rear end and a lot of weight reduction. This swing arm is made from 6061 T6 aluminum. There's no weld, they're machining a solid piece. All the components are made of stainless steel. So you're reducing weight over the stock swing arm by 17 pounds, so a huge weight reduction. The axle is 4130 chrome molly tubing. You get oversized bearings up front, axle adjusters, and safety wire. You also have race jacks, which is a super nice feature. You have three shock positions, and you grant up to 14-inch shocks on the position that's furthest forward. You get a billet caliper mount, so it's machined, not welded. 25 millimeter axle hole, 108 millimeter bolt spread for your caliper. As you can see, these swing arms are a huge improvement, not only in looks, but also in performance. I'll include all the speed dealers information in the description below. If you've got questions or anything like that, make sure you reach out to them, tell them I sent you. Let's get back to it. Um, so you mentioned your riding stuff, like uh, we'll go ahead and like switch over into your bike. So obviously you do a lot of work on like, you took, you've put a ton of like pretty awesome Harleys out there the last several years. Um, but obviously you bought this Challenger for yourself to ride. So mm -hmm. kind of what, what prompted you like to go the Indian route? Um, it's a it's a pretty long winded story. Let's go with <laughs> um, it. <laughs> you know, basically, I, I built the mustard road king mm -hmm. to really showcase every bit of talent that I could offer. Um, it took many years to build that bike. It took a lot of money to to buy the parts, and so many of the parts were handmade and, and one off type scenarios. So that kind of stuff doesn't happen overnight, right? Um, when I finally put that bike out, it it definitely showcased exactly yeah. what my vision was. And I couldn't have been more proud of it, yet I still hopped on it and rode it all around the country, like proving what I'm trying to, to get out there. Um, it, it really stems from the car world. Like you build so many cool cars and you just drive them to the park on Sunday and you sit there and hang out and talk about cars. Yeah. Like you're just sitting in a freaking field talking about things. Like yeah. let's go have fun, right? So that's what it was with the Muster King. Um, but after doing that bike, I realized just how much money I had spent. And it's enough to make you just sick to your stomach, yeah. right? It was well worth it. I, I don't regret it for a second. Um, that being said, I was still working in the custom paint shop and I had a customer who reached out and uh, it was a guy that I, I had spoken with in the past, but I didn't really know him too well. But what I did know is he rode a very similar motorcycle, um, inverted front end, carbon fiber wheels, big motor, uh, really, you know, Olin suspension. I mean, it was dialed in. And this was like 2018, 2019, mm -hmm. uh, when this guy had built his, his bike. So he knew like what these Harleys are capable of. Um, and he says, hey man, I want you guys to paint my Indian Challenger. And I'm like, we work on Harleys. <laughs> like I, at the time I felt like he was asking me to work on a gold wing, you okay. know, yeah, yeah. like that's, I don't know, man, <laughs> what's the deal with that? And he basically said, man, this Indian is so much fun to ride. Um, he, he said, I would rather ride this Indian any day of the week over my Harley. Okay. That always stuck with me because I have a Harley set up just like his mm -hmm. and I love riding that motorcycle. I mean, the, it's fantastic. That's a powerful statement. So it hooked me right there. Mm -hmm. So he brings the bike all the way from Florida up to St. Louis. Okay. And um, here we go, Indian Challenger. Now it's not this one, but 
everything's different. It's full of plastic. Like this is definitely not a Harley. How are we going to make this cool? So I figured out how to take everything apart and, you know, start changing little things here and there, focus on those details. Mm -hmm. And um, we painted it. We got it put back together. Bike looks fantastic. It's basically a stock motorcycle mm -hmm. with a cool paint job. Okay. A couple little touches. So we called him. We said, hey, your bike's done. And he's like, man, I can't make it up there for another week or two. Why don't you take it out and ride it? Try to break it, is what he says. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, don't threaten me with a good time, <laughs> right? right? Yeah. So I did. And so I went out and rode it. Blew my mind. You know, stock motor, stock brakes, stock suspension. Um, I, the bike had ape hangers on it at the mm -hmm. time. Um, basically stock motorcycle. And I couldn't believe how much fun I had riding that motorcycle. Because I have grew up riding on Harleys, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so then I went and I, I picked up, uh, I went and picked up Retta and threw her on the back. And we went out and rode two up. And I was like, hey, what do you? I'm thinking about buying one of these mm -hmm. things. What do you think about it? And she's like, I don't know. It's, it's just not the, the Harley. You know? yeah, and I'm yeah. like, I could just, like, I could tell there's something there. Yeah. So this is in 2020, by the way. And guess what's coming? Um, bagger racing mm -hmm. is about to start blowing up. They're going to start doing uh, Moto America, King of the Baggers. And I know Indian's going to be a part of it. And um, I'm like, man, I need to get one of these bikes and show people that, I believe in this bike mm -hmm. before it gets out mm -hmm. on the track and like what happens if it takes first place, Yeah, which it did by the way, for sure. Uh, <laughs> and what happens if he takes first place and people are like, oh, you bought that bike only because, you know, yeah. king of the baggers or whatever. You want to stay ahead of the curve and whatnot. Yeah. Right? And while, you know, like I don't really, really lose any sleep over what people think, but at the same time, like. I'm not like a sellout kind of mm -hmm. dude. Everything I do is different, fresh. Mm -hmm. I try to do what I'm interested in. I was interested in that motorcycle. So I saved my pennies. Um, I made it happen. I bought the bike in September, October, roughly. I put like 200 miles on it and brought it home and tore it down to nothing. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was literally a motor and a backbone. You know, this bike doesn't have a frame like a Harley mm -hmm. does. So... It's just a motor and a backbone, and it's like, all right, how are we going to make this bike different? You know, it, not many people had made any cool Indian challengers at the yeah, time. Yeah. Um, at that point, we had Kerry Hart, and he had done a challenger. It was a beautiful bike. It turned out cool. Um, I wouldn't say it was, like, majorly cut up and over-the-top custom, mm -hmm. but that bike set the bar, right? And so all I could think was, like, all right, well, we got to make this thing cooler than Carrie Hart's bike. Yeah. Here we go, right? Yeah. And um, here it is. Yeah. You know, so it took me from probably like October, November until like April. So five months, roughly. Um, completely built with, you know, minimal, minimal um, aftermarket support. Mm -hmm. There was basically nothing at the time. Like the day that I bought this bike, nothing existed. Mm -hmm. I just knew, like coming from a fabrication background, that hey, you know, if you want to, if you want to shine above, you got to really step outside of your comfort zone, yeah, and just figure it out. Yeah, so, that would that would definitely be a daunting daunting task. Obviously, <clears> I'm <throat> by no means a builder or anything, but I remember when I had the Dyna before I got the Road Glide, I was mm -hmm. actually looking at getting the Challenger because I just like it. it. Seemed like it had a lot more. You got a lot more for for your money when you bought one just off like the floor compared to like the road glide. I wanted to go right. on the road glide like for other reasons. But one of the big negatives was I was worried about like the amount of aftermarket support out there if I wanted to like change stuff like obviously change it from eights because of the way the interfering is and stuff like that. Right. Yeah. Um so was that probably the biggest challenge with building this bike was just there's not as much out there or um I you know I would say absolutely it was. Um I, I knew I was going to need to showcase this thing in the sense of a paint job, mm -hmm. obviously. It needs to stand out, and if there's not that many products out there, you're going to have to you know, figure out how to make it different. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say that like, the thing that set me over was there's a company called Barnstorm Cycles. Mm -hmm. um, they're in the northeast, like Boston area. Um, they were coming out with their own version of a custom Indian Challenger. And they were the first place to do a, a T-bar setup, mm -hmm. and which is 
unobtainable on a Challenger because of where the screen is at and it's all made, of, the dash is made of plastic. Mm -hmm. And so it's not simple to just make your own plastic dash pieces. So um, Barnstorm was coming out with a dash kit, which would, it would allow you to move everything around, open up the center and put a pullback plate on it and bolt some risers to it. Okay. And I said to myself, you know, that's the one push that I need. Like, this is before I bought my motorcycle, by the way. This yeah. is like August, mm -hmm. September of 2020. Um, it's like, that's the push I need. Like, I don't know what else I'm going to do to this bike, but it's going to have a T-bar setup on it. That's exactly what I need to, you know, start. Mm -hmm. um, and so I actually bought the plastic dash pieces and mm -hmm. the pullback plate. I bought the Barnstrom kit before I bought a motorcycle. <laughs> okay, you were ready to go, man. <laughs> well, I was like, hey man, like these bikes are not popular yet. I think that they could grow in popularity, but if they don't, this may be a one-time opportunity, right? And he was mm -hmm. running it as a pre-order type situation. Okay. It's an expensive kit to buy, so it's an expensive kit to produce. And I don't think he was willing to put out tens of thousands, multiple tens of thousands of dollars in products to have sitting on his shelf. Yeah. So he knew he needed to pre-sell some of these to gauge some interest. Yeah. And so I was like, man, I, I have to get in on that. Yeah. So I bought the dash kit before I owned a motorcycle. Um, and I would probably say the day I bought the dash kit is when I really started reaching out and saying, hey, who has a Challenger like, for sale? You got serious like, at that point. Yeah, calling the dealerships and being like, hey, this is who I am, this is what I'm looking for keep an eye out for a pre-owned or whatever the case is. I knew I was going to, you know, really strip it down mm -hmm. and um, try and sell a bunch of parts off of it so I can build a, my own version of it. Um, I got lucky and a, a, a homie of mine called me and he's like, hey, we got a, a brand new one with 200 miles on it. And the dude just traded it in. He's like, it, we don't even have hit a title with his name on it because it's that new of a oh, bike. Wow. Yeah. And I'm like, cool, what's the price? And he told me, and I was like, I'll be, I'll be here. There. We, here we go. We're doing Let's it. go. And so I signed up for it. And um, so the bike was in the, it was in my shop before the dash kit showed up. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I just started tearing it apart. And what I needed to do first was learn the ins and outs. Mm -hmm. of not only like disassembling something, yeah, it's nuts and bolts, right? But how does this bike work? Why does it handle so good? What makes it different from a Harley? And then from there, focus on the things that I hate and find a way to improve on those things. Okay. And um, to answer your question, yeah, there was no products that lended to that besides the, the dash kit. Um, the rest of it had to just be figured out. So um, I just did the best, to, the best that I could do to, to my ability mm -hmm. using my, um, my talents and then also outside resources and here it is. It was, like I said, like a four or five month build and mm -hmm. 20,000 miles later, yeah. I'm, ju I'm just as happy with this motorcycle as I am the day that I finished it and rode it for the first okay. time. Nice. I mean, I absolutely love this motorcycle. And you've been, you've been racking up some miles too. Yeah. You've been all yeah. over the place in this one, right? Yeah. In October, um, a few months ago, like two or three months ago in October, I took this bike out to head to, where was I going? like the Smokies tour mm -hmm. um, for V-Twin Visionary. And uh, I rode out there and had a great time. You know, I, I, I won't go into the details, but had a great time in the mountains on this bike. And um, then I was heading to Florida to head to uh, Bagger Racing League with Steve Chamberlain. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know what? I've never ridden through the mountains in Georgia. We're going to take the long way. So I just looked at the map and, and you know, figured out a route. And um, by the time I made it home from that trip, I was gone for three weeks. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. That was quite a trip then. <laughs> yeah, dude. I, I think I did like, it wasn't these crazy thousand mile days, but I think I did like 4,500 miles or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, and I just tried to turn it into a business trip and mm -hmm. like stop at certain places that I would, you know, been meeting to go to and just really enjoy it. Um, but that's not how I really planned on it when I left. When I planned, I was going to go to Tennessee, maybe ride it to Florida, mm -hmm. right? I could have rode right back home and drove the truck to Florida or flew to Florida, whatever the case was. 
But I looked at the odometer and I was like, man, I'm at 16,000 miles. I'm like, I really would feel good if I hit 20K yeah, on this yeah. thing. You know, like, and so I just, I let it burn into my brain and I didn't come home until I hit 20,000. Nice. It, it felt really good. Um, admittedly, I do want to just stack miles like that. Yeah. But I'm so busy in the shop here and trying to build a business and a brand and raise a family it's and hard to disappear for three weeks. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I got customers to answer to mm -hmm. and responsibilities here. So I do as much writing as I possibly can, but I want to keep pushing that in the future and showing people like, yeah, like this is what it is we do in this shop, but we promote the riding side just as, yeah, you're just as much as we promote building a cool motorcycle. Yeah, you're not just there to show it off. You're Absolutely. just there to ride it too. All right, man. Uh, let's, I guess, jump into the details a little bit more and everything you had to go through. I know we've talked a little bit about the whole Bornstorm Cycles kit, but uh, I kind of like to run through that. So you said it comes with, I guess, the interfering piece and then the pullback plate, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. um, so is that all pretty much like direct bolt and you just move all the pieces around or how does that work? Yeah, it's basically everything bolts right onto the fairing and moves the, the main uh, screen mm -hmm. up to the top. And then it puts the gauges off to the side. And the point of that is just, you have to open up the middle of the bike to be able to bolt some risers to it. Mm -hmm. And um, at that point, it's basically a, a standard Harley spread on the riser. Uh -huh. So you can run pretty much anything you want. Okay. Um, but there are some limitations on the physical dimensions. Okay. Because as you turn full lock, um, it gets really close to the dash. Okay. So, for example, I have boosted Brad's risers on these on this bike, and um, you can't just bolt those on this bike and walk away because at full turn they'll actually hit the dash. Okay. And so, one of my biggest downfalls on this entire build was not that I ran Brad's risers because I run his stuff all the time, mm -hmm. but so many people reach out and say, "Hey, I really like those risers. Who are they?" And I'll tell them and I'll say, "Hey, by the way." You can fit them on the bike, but they're going to hit the dash. Okay. And I hate that because it, it's a great look on this mm -hmm. bike, but I had to make some pretty serious changes to be able to do that. Do you have to change the risers up some or just like how the bar is or like? Um, I had to reshape the dash. And okay. so actually the whole fairing on this bike is actually moved forward on it to, to make some clearance on it. Okay. And it's just done in a way that you would never be able to tell. Okay. So um, one so of those things, you know, when you're in the, the heat of the moment and you got to have this product and you're going to do whatever it takes to make, make it, it work. work. Yeah. Okay. So it's like, was it three and a half cent, three and a half inches on center? It's like normal spread for riders. So yeah, that's it's just regular same. Harley. Yeah. Okay. Regular Harley bolt setup, uh, okay. bolt pattern. So, so you can run, I guess, just about any riser, you got to make the hole hitting the. Yeah. The, the so. key is you really need a round riser on a bike okay. like this. Um, anything that's going to be square or rectangular. Okay. That immediate outside sharp edge of a square. Okay. Is what's going to hit the dash. Okay. Yeah. So it, it's a little insider type thing that most people wouldn't know going into okay, it. Okay. So it's lower down where it hits the bed. Okay. All right. Yeah. It's I'm below the screen. It. It's like right in front of the risers pretty much. Okay. So. All right. But, you know, concerning the rest of it, um, yeah, I mean, that is essentially, it's a bolt-on. What we're doing these days is we're suggesting, um, we sell a lot of these kits to people. And since we have more experience in the Challenger stuff than a lot of other people do, we kind of know where the height needs to be. Okay. And so I'm able to show people different types of risers they can run that will clear a dash okay. and then offer pullback versions, straight versions, okay. different heights on the bars. Um, unfortunately, there's, there's a lot of little details that go into it, um, even on the handlebars. Are you running the, was it the Flymoto bars that are? Yeah, okay. so those are Flymoto bars. Um, while they do bolt to a Harley riser, the the twist grip center, which mm -hmm. is your throttle by wire, it's a different pattern, so you gotta recut that. Um, the switch packs, like the, the electronic switch housings, uh -huh. they need some modifications. Okay. And so you can't be afraid to cut, grind, drill a little bit okay. here and there, um, but it's nothing crazy. You're not reinventing a wheel. Okay. So it is, in my mind, it's a bolt-on. Okay. With a few modifications. Yeah. So you've got to do right. a little bit of work. Kind of yeah. But even then, the average Joe, I've, I've helped out a lot of average Joes. Okay. And they can handle it as well. Okay. So we've been helping um, a lot of people fine-tune where they need to be because they don't have a baseline to start with. Mm -hmm. um, this was like the 
probably number two or three challenger in the world with T-bars on it. Mm -hmm. And so three years later, we've done enough to know like, okay, how tall are you? And where do you think you want to be on height? Okay. And it's not as simple as saying, oh, well, I want to have a 12 inch riser. Yeah. Well, guess what? There's other factors to count in. Like the pullback plate mm -hmm. is almost four inches tall. Okay. So you go with the eight inch, or I'm sorry, a 12 inch riser on a mm -hmm. four inch pullback with a bar. Dude, you got 20 inches of rise yeah. on your you handlebars. Take your Harley bar height and expect to reproduce it. Yeah, you're back to ape hangers okay. at that point. So okay. it's, it's, it's a little bit different, but you know, that, that's where a dude like me can, can really stand out and help people out. Yeah. Um, I will take the time. I, I will preach the gospel, so okay. to say, yeah. and, and educate. Just because I, I believe in the motorcycle mm -hmm. and um, I know someone is, is going to love their experience with that setup. So I'll go above and beyond. Yeah. Um, but anyways, as far as the bars go, yeah, I mean, essentially it's pretty much a bolt-on. Okay. Um, I, I do run Behringer hand controls yeah. on all of my bikes only because they work so much better and they look so much better. Um, another little funky one is the, the hand controls on mm -hmm. a Challenger. They actually clamp at inch and a quarter. Okay. Where most Harleys are one inch. One inch, yeah. Yeah. And so um, there are ways around this with adapters and, and such, but the Behringer's bolt right onto a one inch bar. Okay. Off you go. Okay. So yeah, it's a little bit more money, but it's absolutely justified. So okay. any, any challenger I'm gonna do is gonna have Behringer's on it. That's a guarantee. To the right fitment and all. Absolutely. But um, other than that, you know, it, it's, it's a pretty basic build. We mostly just cut a lot of stuff on this bike, um, change some things around, you know, I wanted to focus on the ugly parts mm -hmm. of the bike. Everybody says the same thing. Mm -hmm. Man, it's a cool bike, but there's too much plastic. Yeah. Or, yeah. man, I, I really like the way it looks, but the motor looks like it belongs in a toy. Mm -hmm. Or whatever the case yeah, is. Yeah. So, so I wanted to focus on taking those ugly points and make them disappear. Okay. Or not make them jump out. Okay. That's and fair. so that's what I did on just some of the choices with the coatings. Um, you know, I, so, I, I spent a lot of time and effort matching the, the powder coating on the motor, uh -huh. which is like a matte charcoal color. Yeah. And we actually ran that. I ran that throughout the entire bike. So most of the motorcycle is powder coated to match the motor. Okay. Which gives it this really futuristic, unique looking mm -hmm. feel. Um, for example, you look at the radiator shroud, which mm -hmm. kind of represents the chassis right there. Yeah. And it's that, that charcoal color. Um, so it just makes it stand out compared to any other challenge you're going to see. Okay. So from there, um, we developed, uh, this is the first challenger to be lifted two mm -hmm. inches over stock. Okay. Um, you know, I've, I come off of a Harley that's, that's super tall off the ground, maximum ground clearance mm -hmm. for high speed cornering and maneuverability. Um, I have to have that. So we developed the first way to do that. Um, the cool part about it is we're using stock suspension. Okay, it's still, I, that was a question for, I know like yeah. Challenger comes inverted, but like, so it's still stock, okay. Yeah, so it comes with inverted front end, uh, comes with Brembo radial brake calipers on it. Stops fantastic, the suspension is great. Um, but it's too low to the ground still. Mm -hmm. So we got with uh, Bare Knuckle Performance, who's local to me, mm -hmm. um, really good friend of mine, and we said, hey, you're a badass machinist. Do you think you're interested in helping me move forward on this project? He said, absolutely. Um, essentially, it was probably two or three months, and we had developed a kit for the front and the rear. Okay. So we can retain factory suspension, but raise it two inches. Okay. And it not only offers that much more ground clearance, but it's amazing the way that it makes the bike handle. Okay. Um, it's so much more nimble. It, it's just, it gives you that confidence at any speed, any corner, you got it under control. Oh, nice. Yeah, and, and it's with stock suspension. That's awesome, yeah. So all you're having to just, <clears throat> just a two over kit all the way around yeah. and you move on. Okay. I mean, essentially you can drop 450 bucks and raise your bike up two inches. Okay. And it handles just about as good as okay. like, a full Owens inverted oh, front end on a wow. Harley. Wow, and from the factory, that's 
Yeah, that's pretty it's that ass, good. Dude. It really is. Um, Go back to what I said about building a Harley with how much money it took yeah. to make it do what I needed it to do. This bike did all of that from Just the factory. From the factory? Yeah, and so I, I didn't want to like sell out and like not go all in building a bike, mm -hmm. but if I can save some money, I mean, yeah, we, everybody wants to save money, right? Don't, don't pick something that isn't broken kind of deal. Yeah. Exactly. And so, you know, if you were to put this bike on a track, like you watch the bagger racing mm -hmm. and stuff like that, yeah, the, the stock front end, you're gonna need an upgrade. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're pushing it at 150 and you're flying into a corner and going from 150 to 20 mile an hour, yes, it's gonna have its limits. But for the most part, mountain riding, um, canyons, twisties, you name it, it's fantastic. And it's it's honestly bone stock. And yeah. it feels so weird to say that. But I mean, no, that was, when I was looking initially, that was one of my biggest things, was like, you get all, your, like your suspension and then like your brakes are like, miles ahead of what you get like stock Harley. So mm -hmm. this Absolutely. is when you're building, like that's money you save that you can put towards. So there is like, like GP, um, yeah. GP suspension does a cartridge for this bike. Okay. Um, I'm sure it's fantastic, but they, they can't do it in a, in an extended version. So mm -hmm. you're still going to be at a stock height motorcycle with GP suspension. Okay. Um, that ain't, that's not going to do me any good. Not with the way that I like to ride. Mm -hmm. Um, for a, a lot of people, it's, it's fantastic. I'm sure. Um, but yeah, stock suspension with 20,000 miles and I, you know, I, I have pushed this bike to it, this bike to its limits and, you know, maybe there's been a moment or two where I'm like, man, I wish it would have done this just a little bit better. Mm -hmm. But then I very quickly backpedal and I'm like, wait a minute, you didn't put a penny into it. Yeah. You're good. Everything's yeah. fine. Yeah. There so, you go. Yeah, so the suspension's fantastic. Um, the chassis is completely made up of aluminum. Okay. So it's very lightweight. Uh, it does not have a full chassis. You can think of this bike as a, like a big Lego set. Okay. Everything bolts to a motor. Okay. Okay, so it's an underslung style chassis. Um, the very bottom of the motorcycle is the oil pan of the motor. Okay. So you keep all that weight all the way down at the bottom, mm -hmm. and it's gonna make the bike that much more nimble. So it's the opposite of a Harley because you have all of that weight from the front to the back of a rolling chassis mm -hmm. where this bike, the only weight is just the motor. Okay. See yeah. what I'm saying? So if you took just the aluminum pieces from the frame and you unbolted them and set them on a scale, it would be a quarter of what a Harley chassis weighs. Okay. And that's part of why these bikes handle as good as, as how they do. Okay. Um, on top of that, mono shock rear suspension, adjustable preload, um, it's, it's not your Harley adjuster knob on the mm -hmm. left side. Um, it's fantastic. It works. Um, everybody loves how the M8 soft tail rides. Guess what? It's got a monoshock on it. Mm -hmm. So does this bike. <laughs> so same concept or similar concept. Kind of yeah. And, 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 you know, we've been anticipating since probably 2022, a monoshock Harley bagger platform. Mm -hmm. Still well, waiting. it's 2023, yeah, and the only thing waiting. we got was yeah. a mustard Rogue King. And yeah, right? guess what? I already did that. <laughs> so um, hopefully 2024, and we're going to have a, a, a Monoshock Harley bagger. Mm -hmm. And will I be interested in it? Absolutely, I will. I mean, that's the future of motorcycles. Most of the other motorcycles on the planet do have Monoshock suspensions on them. Mm -hmm. They're just not like, they're not Harleys, so people yeah. don't talk about them. Yeah. You know? Um, other than that, like another really cool point is the exhaust pipe. This is made by CMP. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the first one in the world on a Challenger to be a full length all the way out the back stainless steel two into one mm -hmm. uh, exhaust pipe. Which it wasn't, I remember seeing a post from like forever ago. You had to do a bunch of work for that, right? With going to two into one versus like the duels, um, like the way the. So not like, maybe not as much as what you would think. Okay. Um, the biggest, the biggest uh, thing that you're going to run into on a Challenger with the exhaust is one of those cheaper aspects, mm -hmm. right? So the saddlebags, they do bolt on right here, mm -hmm. but the bottom of the bag sits on the muffler. Okay. Physically touches it. Okay. There's a big rubber isolator there, but it sits on the muffler and it keeps it nice and stout. It doesn't move around. It's fine. But as soon as you get rid of a left side muffler, 
now your saddlebag's flopping around in the wind. Okay. Right? So you got to come up with a way to support your saddlebags. And a lot of companies have come up with an idea to do that. Um, there's probably five to ten of them at this point. Most of them are a really ugly way to do it mm -hmm. with some sort of a bar that's going to protrude from the front of the bag up to the lower crash bar. Okay. So it kind of looks like you have like a little step ladder to climb on your bike. Yeah. Or it's going to be some really cheaply produced thin metal brackets that bolt to the bag and go to the subframe or whatever. And yeah, you bolt it on and, and it works, but you can still grab your bag and flop it around. You okay. Know, CMP, uh, the owner, him and I worked directly together you know, a, a lot of hours to fine tune exactly how we wanted to make this pipe look and perform. And it's the best stuff. It's the best stuff out there. There's, there's no other way to put it. Okay. So that's the number one. Um, it works good. It doesn't break. It looks fantastic. Makes a, a ton of power. Um, he's very well known for building high horsepower motors, mm -hmm. big inch turbo motors. Okay. And so, He's a master at his craft, basically. Okay. So we're happy to be teamed up with CMP directly. We're the only distributor for his exhaust pipes on Indian motorcycles. So, and that okay. stems right off of this one right here. That's a question for you. You talk about you talk about power, and uh, I guess one of my questions is like, what all you've done to the motor? I know like there's different terms of like drivability and how like motor reacts and responds between like Harley's and Indian, um, but I guess in terms of the motor. Mm -hmm. What all have you done to actually done to the motor? Or had to so do the motor? essentially the motor is bone stock. Okay. The only thing we have changed is visual effects on it, like mm -hmm. coating purposes. Mm -hmm. And I am running the Indian, what they call the stage two cams. Okay. Okay. Now those cams, um, I don't know if I'm supposed to say this out loud, but they're, they're made by S&S &S, uh -huh. basically. So it's a good cam. Mm -hmm. Um, but it, it has stage two cams, um, it has the exhaust pipe, and essentially the only other thing done to it to make power is it, the ECM has been retuned. Okay. Um, it basically, the, 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 the worst part about this bike is from the factory it has a governor at 112 miles an hour. Okay. So it will not go faster than 112. So by the time you do your cams and your pipe and you have the ECM retuned, um, they'll remove that. So the bike is capable of doing 150 easily. Okay. And um, smooths out the throttle blade, so it's the idle is a lot nicer, smoother. Okay. Um, and it, you'll gain a little bit of horsepower and torque out of it. Okay. So, um, believe it or not, this bike has never been on a dyno, mm -hmm. ever. It runs fantastic. It sounds amazing. It'll keep up with any Harley you throw at it, um, including a 131 crate motor. Okay. Um, if you're gonna do a flat out drag race, is it gonna win? It's gonna be close, right? But I'm talking a 131 crate motor here. Yeah. Okay. Um, I have about 800 bucks into some cams and two grand into an exhaust pipe. So we're talking three grand into making this motor fast mm -hmm. versus a six, $7,000 crate motor. Okay. And it keeps up with that bike. Okay. Um, I mean, and, this is a lot too. I mean, cause you've also built like what big trouble motors was like big trouble motors like both in the 150s and yeah that towards, motor so. that was a fuel moto kit uh -huh. uh, that's a 150 horsepower motor um the mustard road king like we talked about earlier um that bike was 145 horse i mean big inch mm -hmm. and a lot of horsepower a lot of torque this bike keeps up with them no problem okay you know nice. it's going to depend on who's sitting on the seat yeah obviously yeah yeah <laughs> but you know if you're drag racing are you going to win every time maybe not but you're going to be Real close, Real close right? and for what you put into it. On a, on, a, on a drag racing strip, right? Yeah. If you're out in the mountains in the twisties, it just depends on who's on the bike. Yeah. And this bike will keep up with anything. I mean, it's that capable with minimal amounts of money put into it. Okay. And I just found such a level of satisfaction with not having to go over the top on the engine with reliability concerns, overheating concerns um you know one thing that people hate about this bike is it does have a radiator mm -hmm. it's water cooled guess what i have never seen this bike run hotter than 210 degrees oh wow yeah, ever so. 
And the last time I checked the engine temps on a heavy built Milwaukee 8, we're talking 350. Oh, easily, yeah. Minimum? Yeah. So that's a huge difference between your legs, especially when you're sitting in traffic. Um, I just kind of fell in love with like those creature comforts of it. <laughs> yeah. So, and it, it's just reliable and fun. You know, it's, it, it's, it's apples to oranges, okay. Indian versus Harley. Okay. Um, but I can say some cons about it too, obviously. Um, yeah, there's a lot of plastic. You know, you got to learn how to deal with some of that stuff. Some of it's a little cheaply made. Um, it sounds like a four-wheeler when you start it, <laughs> you know? Um, it, there's, there's a few cons to it, but for the bang for the buck, for someone who's going to really ride their motorcycle, okay. you literally cannot compare a Harley to this motorcycle. Okay. Um, it's that great of a bike. So I have high hopes for Harley in the future, and I'd be happy to hop back on one and, and keep doing my thing. But right now, I'm just hooked. You're, you're I'm absolutely this. hooked. Okay. It, it's just the less you have to wrench on your bike, the more you get to ride your bike. The more you get to enjoy it. It's yeah. so much more fun. Um, um, especially if you're not constantly worried about, oh, like this is a little off or that's a little off. Or dude, kind of my last trip that I did, you know, 4,000 miles on, mm -hmm. I was gone for three weeks. My only concern in the world was, where's the next Starbucks? <laughs> that was it. That's all I cared about. Bring on the rain, bring on the snow. Hell, it dropped down to 40, 50 degrees when I was on that trip. Mm -hmm. And I plugged in my heated gear and off I go. Just gone. Happy as, as I could be. And I never once thought about the bike. Okay. I know the bike is good to go. You don't True. ever think twice about it. That's a, on a trip, that's a huge piece of mind. It really is. Yeah. Worrying about like, <clears throat> Like having to worry about your bike and if it's going to make the trip or if you're going to have some kind of issue or like ruin a trip and be able yeah. to not think about that is that's a huge statement right there. And my main my main selling point to it is I've done it on the Harleys and it doesn't matter how good you are it doesn't matter how awesome your motor is it's a Harley they break yeah and yeah this this can break too of course anything mechanical can but it's proved itself at this point and so I'm a I'm a firm believer in it and. Um, you know, we have a lot of big plans for the future on these bikes. Um, we're going into a lot of new parts development mm -hmm. on these motorcycles, in specific the Challenger. Um, we've already designed a Baja LP6 headlight for this bike. Mm -hmm. So it's a direct bolt-on, plug-and-play, minimal modifications, and you have the best light known to man. Um, what else have we done on these bikes? Yeah, you know, run through, yeah some of your parts. I know we were the bars, obviously you just touched your headlight. Yep. Um, you're running some carbon wheels as well, right? Yeah, so the carbon wheels are BST wheels. Mm -hmm. um, it's no different than any of the carbon BST wheels that we run on the Harleys in the okay. shop as well. Just the Indian version. Uh, so it's the Torque Tech wheel. Um, I prefer to stick with like a 19 on, on a bike like this. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it makes a big difference as far as uh, the unsprung weight Unsprung conversation weight, yeah. and better braking, faster acceleration. You know, it's not necessarily measurable on a dyno or anything like that, but you can feel it in, in the motorcycle for I mean, sure. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely like a legit thing, especially when you watch like race teams, whether it's cars or motorcycles or whatever, mm -hmm. and they're constantly chasing like the whole unsprung weight deal, so. Yeah, yeah. And, and just saving the weight in itself is, it's huge mm -hmm. on, on a, a big motorcycle like this. Okay. You know, you can make a really big impact on, on just focusing on weight reduction mm -hmm. rather than making a ton of power. Yeah. So, but yeah, the wheels, you know, we dressed them up and pinstriped them and added my logos to it. Um, the forks are recoded. You know, we coated the, the forks gold. We refinished the tubes and the sliders. Um, it looks like a really, really custom over the top front end. Mm -hmm. It's factory. It's factory except yeah. for the two over. Like, yeah, okay. it's just recoding is all it is. Um, we, like I said, we did, worked with bare knuckle performance on the lift, the lift kit for this bike. Uh, we're the first to do that. The full length stainless pipe for this bike, we're the first to do that. Um, what else have we been doing? We've been raising the saddlebags on these things mm -hmm. as far as we can go. Okay. Um, next up, we're developing an FTR front fender conversion for this bike. Okay. So what I'm running on this one is a Clockworks version. Okay. Um, great fender, it's fantastic, but we want something a little bit more sporty looking. Okay. And so we're gonna be, uh, develop um, a, a bolt-on bracket to where you can buy an FTR fender and bolt it right to your chamber. Okay. And it's going to be a completely different visual. 
Okay. Um, we're working on a couple different signature series wheels for these bikes um, in the billet aluminum fashion. So the biggest thing on these bikes is every one of them has the same wheel on it. And when you're trying to make an impact visually, it's pretty tough to do when they all have the same set of wheels. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, I've powder coated numerous sets of these wheels. They look cool when they're a different color, not the carbon wheels, but the stock wheels. Yeah, yeah. Um, they look cool, but it's a factory wheel. It's the same wheel, yeah. Everybody has it. So um, we're putting out a Challenger pretty soon that's going to debut at Daytona this year. It's got okay. a one-off set of wheels. Nice. Yeah, it's a bare knuckle um, anti-hero wheel. It's really, really pretty. Uh, it's built aluminum. It's going to be a completely unique visual for a Challenger. Oh, okay. So that'll be our first set that we're coming out um, on a build. And then from there, we're going to step it up and kind of come up with our own signature series wheels um, for Indian Challengers specifically. Oh, and that, that's awesome. That's like more aftermarket parts for Challengers. Exactly. And, yeah. You know, you mentioned it to me earlier. I really, you said I really like the Challenger, but there wasn't a lot of stuff for mm -hmm. it. I want to be that guy who listens to that and says, hey, I have the stuff for it. And um, it's really just the beginning of it. You know, the future is, we'll see what happens with it. But this is what it takes is, is a guy like me to step in and, and really believe in a product. And yeah, 100%. Make it and like, so yeah. you bring things to the market like that, like, I mean, that helps everybody out because it's like you know, more as, as a, from a consumer perspective, that helps absolutely. Out. Yeah, hardly any you know, like when there's more competition. So yeah, we're working towards a seat as well. You know, this seat was handmade by Saddleman for me. Okay, um, Saddleman's been a huge supporter of mine from day one. Mm -hmm. And my biggest concern with this is I do have a mid control setup on this, and with T bars, I felt like I was I was reaching. Okay. And when you're going to do 500 miles a day, you need to be comfortable. That'll wear on you, yeah. Well, I'm not trying to look like a dork with a backrest, right? <laughs> so I needed to be comfortable. And so I worked with Saddleman to get a, a one-off type seat made, which is going to push me forward, keep me comfortable. Okay. And um, I'm really working towards coming up with a seat for the short, the shorter-minded rider. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm 5'8", so I'm not super tall. And it's a huge motorcycle. So yeah. it's a key to get your seat in the right position. Um, so we're hoping to be doing some stuff with a seat in the future. Um, we're working on some build aluminum latch covers. Okay. You know, these are big, bulky plastic. Yeah. I made these look as cool as they can from the factory. They don't look this cool. Yeah. <laughs> um, but we're working on a new version that's going to be build aluminum. Um, hoping to work towards a set of risers so okay. that, you know, the riser conversation we had. It's not, it's not an issue anymore. Yeah. I just, I don't want any more types of issues so I can just say, hey, you need a set that looks cool but does exactly what you need it to do. Here you go. Okay. Um, for specifically for a challenger. So okay. a lot of stuff in the works coming. Um, I'd say this year is going to be a big year for it. Um, another cool thing. Sorry to it, if, no. Keep sorry going. To interrupt. No, no, keep another going. cool thing is we have a, a really big thing going with Music City Indian this year from Nashville. Yeah. 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 Uh, Music City, amazing people. Um, we're going to be getting a brand new twenty three challenger in here in the next couple weeks. Awesome. And uh, we're going to kind of throw together what would be your average Joe kind of Indian challenger. So okay. we're going to hit the key notes on that bike. We're, gonna, we're just going to throw the right seat on it. Um, my headlight, of course. Uh, a set of T-bars with a Barnstorm kit. Mm -hmm. And we're going to hit those key notes that a guy really, really wants. Like those same things you always want to do. And exactly. You have a bar seat, bars. And yep. Oh, okay. And so what we're going to do is we're going to keep all these products in stock so that they're readily available. You're not waiting two or three months for it. Um, and we're gonna be pushing this kind of like a starter kit, okay, a guy would yeah. call it. You know, It's a way to get started, to make your bike cool, feel different, and then from there, if you wanna go full-blown custom paint job, or you wanna lift it up taller, you want mid controls, give me a call, we'll make it happen. That makes a, that makes a ton of sense, mm -hmm. because I think mean, when, you, when you buy a bike, the first things you always look at, or like, always look at, or like, Parts. Your bars, your seat, and yep. your exhaust. Those what can I buy first, like, right? Right off the bat. And like I said, when I was looking at it, my biggest issue was this, the whole issue up there. And so you guys are, uh, I guess, providing a solution to that for people. Absolutely. So. I'm, I'm seeing an opportunity. And it's not something that I had planned on. But I get so many people that reach out. And I'm spending so much time giving all this advice. Yeah. I'm like, man, I can simplify this. Maybe make a little bit of money doing yeah. it. And putting a lot of smiles on people's yeah. faces. 100%. And so this week alone, I think I have ordered between four and six handlebar and riser setups for Indian Challengers. 
It's awesome. In, in just this week alone. Yeah. And so it's going really good so far and we want to keep pushing it. You know, we're building the website up and getting more products on there. We're doing more events than we've ever done. Um, and we're just going to keep pushing that this year. Nice. So while doing plenty of Harley stuff too. Yeah. I mean, you know, like we're, not, said, we're not giving up on Harleys, but uh, you're building, you're building both. Like I mentioned earlier, you've built some of the, mm -hmm. thank you. Harleys thank you very much. Yeah. In my opinion, I'm not an expert. Yeah. I mean, um, well, you have to, you have to adapt, you know, and, and it also comes to a point of you want to keep things fresh and interesting. And for a guy like myself, I need, I need some sort of challenge, mm -hmm. no pun intended, of course, but yeah. I need some sort of a challenge to keep me really interested and keep my, my head in the game. Keep the drive going and like, yeah. yeah. I just like smashing goals. And yep. so this was a good way to do that for myself. Okay. Um, moving forward, I just want to go deeper and deeper on products and okay. just making the bike even better than it already is. Okay. And uh, having yeah. a blast doing it. You're so. good, yeah. I, got, I do want to move on to some other questions, but before we move on yeah. from this one, um, this is a little ignorance on my part with challenges. Do they, do they come in mid controls? No, absolutely okay. not. Um, the mid controls, they were a a very limited run with Barnstorm as well. Okay. Okay. So the owner of Barnstorm, Jake, um, very talented builder. Um, he he knew that the two key points to what we would call a performance oriented motorcycle, right? Riding position and being able to take corners and, and ride the bike fast. Um, handlebar setup is number one and foot position is number two. You need to feel comfortable to be able to hit those corners at high speeds. And so he did develop a barnstorm mid control setup. Okay. And he did a fantastic job, but your general public motorcycle rider is not needing make controls mm -hmm. on his bagger. So I don't quote me, but I want to say he did like somewhere between 10 and 30 sets okay. of make controls. Um, obviously I'm proud to say that there's been at least six or seven of those sets mm. through my shop. Okay. Nice. <laughs> so yeah. we got the make control set up kind of corner to you there. In fact, there's a closet right behind you right. with a brand new set in the box okay. for that just in case, you know, there you go. Yeah. So uh, I'm not going to sell them, by the way. Okay. Well, never mind. No. Nope. Uh, so, because we don't know if anything's ever going to happen again. Okay. And you, yeah, if you've got future stuff going on. Right. Now. To keep things simple. Yeah. Um, now, a guy can build his own mid control setup. That's nothing new. Mm -hmm. um, but in this shop, time is money. So yeah. if, if you want to be able to enjoy your family life, ride your motorcycle, yeah. sit on the couch and watch a Netflix You're gonna TV need show. Those at some point versus having to build your Man, own. Man, I don't know that I can invest another 30 hours in a building make control setup yeah, for my personal fair. bike. Yeah, that's if fair. it's a customer's bike, it might be a different story. Yeah. So um, yeah, it's, it's, a, a, it's a unique setup. It's really cool. For a short guy, it's, it's very handy. Mm -hmm. um, I think my next one, I'll probably keep floorboards on it. Okay. To be honest, I don't know what it's like to ride a Challenger with floorboards. <laughs> so yeah. it's had mid since the day that I built it. Um, yeah. That's fair, and you finish those off with the Boosted Brad stuff as well? Yeah, so same with the risers. Um, Boosted Brad almost every time. You know, Brad's a super talented dude um, from Tennessee, so yeah, he's right. a neighbor, and um, yeah, we're, we'll stick with Brad forever. I mean, he's a fantastic dude. Anyways, right. um, what else do you have for me? Indian versus Harley, here we go. Um, <coughs> oh, I mean, I'm not, I'm not an Indian versus Harley person. Like I said, I, I seriously consider these when I was looking at a bagger. I like all kinds of different bikes. I'm not all. I'm not one of those guys that's like, fuck Indian or fuck whatever because it's not Harley. Like, yeah, a lot of people aren't going to like that. But like, I'm. I like a lot of different kinds of bikes. For sure. These. Like, I, that's I been a cool part about this bike. Yeah. Is like, it, I was like Harley Davidson, right? Yeah. Not like hell yeah, brother, but like I like my Harleys. Yeah. Well, this thing definitely changed my perspective yeah. on yeah. motorcycling in general. Um, look at what the Pan Americas did to yeah, 100%. Harley riders. And while we've seen, we've seen plenty of people buy them and sell them, right? They gave up on it real quick. We've also seen a lot of them stick with them. Yeah. And it sounds a lot of opinion to change because I had a KTM 1290 Super Adventure about mm -hmm. uh, what, a year, year and a half before the Pan America came out. And everybody was like, oh, what the fuck is that thing in essence kind of deal? Right. Um, but now, like, it's completely, in terms of the Harley environment, I feel like they have a completely different perspective of, like, adventure bikes and things like that. So, yeah, it, yeah, it's cool. You know, I think they did a great job. Um, I, I I probably am guilty of saying something like, 
oh man, if I was gonna buy an adventure bike, it'd be a KTM, mm -hmm. not a Harley. And to this day, I'd still probably go buy a KTM. Yeah, yeah I agree with that. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, man. Um, I ride with one of my best friends in the world has a Pan America, mm -hmm. and I wouldn't say he's the fastest dude you've ever ridden with. Mm -hmm. But when he's on that Pan America, good luck keeping up with that dude. Dude, they're they're great bikes. I mean, yeah, you know, you're, you're great views, great reviews from everybody, not only in the Harley world but the ADV world as well. So yeah, um, yeah. yeah, I just I just think of like I don't like things to become stale. So. Yeah. I, it doesn't mean that things have to get less cool. Mm -hmm. um, and this was my version of that. And the Pan America, you know, I'm not going to say that I have, like, these high goals to, like, build a Pan America. Mm -hmm. I really don't. But I'm just glad there's something else out there that's yeah. continuing to push. Yep. Um, things that are different, unique, and let's not all just continue to get stuck in the same trends. And evolution is what it's all about. Yeah, 100%. You know, and ad adapting to the next the next exciting thing yeah so so i guess you mentioned that you mentioned the uh, the deal with music city indian earlier mm -hmm. and you've got another indian sitting back there that i think you're going to build as well right so what are the big things you're taking from this build to that build that you're gonna that you might do differently or different concepts that kind of deal the more you do something the better you get at it mm -hmm. so i'm going to be a lot quicker at being able to produce another one um I may focus a little bit in the suspension department okay. on that bike, just because. You know, when I started, I said, this suspension works so good, you don't need to spend five grand to upgrade it. And I have proved that. Now I would like to know what happens if you do spend five grand to upgrade it. Okay. Um, and then I like to have a valid opinion from every aspect of it. Yeah. So maybe I'll do some suspension upgrades. Um, I definitely have the paint job rolling in my brain which is, um, you know, you got to make it look cool. Yeah. You got to make it stand out. So yeah. um, different paint, of course. Um, I think I'm going to stick with floorboards on the next one. Okay. But other than that, just tall, aggressive, fast, make it look fast sitting still, and then go ride it fast. And, nice. I mean, that's really all that. There you go. It's a very simple formula. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> so make them fast and ride them. Like, that sounds like a pretty yeah. good formula to me. That was, uh, sorry, you mentioned the paint. That was one thing we didn't actually cover at all. So yeah. uh, I guess walk us through, like, who did your paint? Kind of what was y'all's concept going in? That kind of deal. Um, well, uh, originally I wanted to do a full carbon fiber body on this okay. bike. Um, solely for weight savings mm -hmm. and being different. Um, financially, it was just not possible. So... We decided to paint it. I knew that I needed to paint it a color that Indian did not offer. It needs to stand out in a sense of, whoa, I've never seen that color on that bike before. Mm -hmm. So we chose this tan color. It's a, it's a Jeep color. Um, it's called Gobby. It stands for Asian Desert. Okay. You know, inside, insider joke there. <laughs> um, I did all the metal work, smoothed out the fender, cut the rear fender, I'm sorry, cut the front fender, modified the dash, the latch covers, the dash, made all these changes, did the body work. Um, my previous employer, who I mentioned earlier, um, I worked in a paint shop for 12 years. So him and I, we're still doing paint jobs together. His name's Springle, uh, amazingly talented dude. He's my best friend. Mm -hmm. um, so him and I did this paint job together. So what we did is I did all the prep, he based it, cleared it. Um, I prepped it for graphics. And then I brought in my, my buddy, Austin Poland from okay. Poland Designs. Yeah, yeah. And so Poland had signed up real quickly to do some graphics on this bike. And I, it was just an absolute honor to me um, because he doesn't paint a lot of motorcycles. Yeah. Um, so he came out and we had an idea of what we wanted to do, but nothing was sketched. We're just going to roll with it. Grab the tape, start laying tape lines. And, um, you know, the three of us in four days, I want to say we probably worked 12, 14 hour days um, with three of us. And we had had most of the graphics finished. Okay. So we just kind of used experience and talent. And here you go. <laughs> Basically. Um, it took about a week to do the graphics mm -hmm. and then it took about another week to, you know, sand it back down, um, do some pinstriping, re-clear it, cut and buff, all that stuff. Um, admittedly, we probably have over 200 hours into this paint job, okay. which is not 
very feasible. Okay. When you're charging a hundred plus dollars an hour on a paint job. Yeah. All right. You're talking twenty thousand dollars for a paint job. Um, I used all of my talents to produce what you see. So did Springle. So did Poland. Um, so it was absolutely a team effort on this paint job in specific, okay. and couldn't be more proud of it. Yeah. I mean, I believe this bike will set the bar moving forward for uh, all time on Indian challengers. I mean, uh, this is the one, you know? I think, yeah, you can 100% say that with confidence. I don't mean it, like, I'm a very humble dude, but I, after three years of, of I, owning this bike, I, I couldn't be more proud of it and just the efforts that went into it. And, yeah, just having a great time doing it. Cool, man. So, dude, uh, thanks a ton for uh, doing this with me. Um, if anybody wants to get in touch with you about something on this bike, ordering a part related to this bike, getting some work done or whatever. What's the best way for people to get in touch with you? For sure. Um, we have a website, foreverrad.com. Um, Instagram, forever underscore rad underscore. Pretty simple. I'm up, 20, you know, 18 hours a day. So <laughs> I'm an easy man to find. I'm at all the rallies, all the events. Um, you know, we are your go-to for Harleys and Indians um, that not only look amazing, but perform even better than they look. Um, you know, it's not a quick process, it's not a cheap process, but it is the real deal. And we are out there pushing these bikes to their limits with dudes just like you yep. and having the time of our lives doing it. Yep. You know, there's nothing fake about it. It's as real as it comes. So yep. thank awesome. you for uh, coming by the shop too. Glad oh, you like it. it. It's an honor. I mean, I think you've had a hand in what, two or three of the bikes so far on my channel that have been just ridiculous and harley so it's cool to like kind of finally get around to doing some of your bikes kind of deal. i appreciate so. it, man like i said hard work pays off you know you just gotta you gotta stay focused and just put it in and and make it happen and um we're just doing our best having a good time there we go so on to the next one thanks for tuning in i'm gonna put all this kyle's information down in the description his social media links website all that kind of stuff i'll put all the sponsor stuff down there my patreon website um uh, check it out. Supporting me helps keep all this going. That kind of deal. Click like and subscribe. That's what it's all about. Yeah, he said it. Get that moto. All right. Thanks. Hugs.